Um, Thursday evening, Thursday evening, 5.30 is the time. And I, I would also encourage you to think about, well, there are people who have kind of given up on God or given up on the church. But they wish they'd find him again. So it would be a great thing to, to bring somebody along or invite somebody along for, for Christmas Eve this week. And as you think about that, uh, as we're heading toward Christmas, I have exciting news for you. If you've been looking for a white Christmas, if you drive to Minnesota Lake, you can have a white Christmas today. There's snow down there. It might melt this afternoon. But it, it may snow Wednesday, so who knows? You, 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 may, you may get some, yeah. Uh, tomorrow evening is going to be something pretty unique. Uh, the planets of Jupiter and Saturn are coming together in a very unique conjunction. It happens every 400 years or so. So the last time it was visible was almost a thousand years ago, 994 years ago. So it's going to be tomorrow evening. It'll be in the southwestern sky about an hour after sunset. So, you know, that, that may be what the wise men follow. We're, we're not sure just how God worked that out, but go ahead and take a look at the sky out in the southwest tomorrow evening, and about an hour after sunset, and it's a very unique astronomical phenomenon. Uh, thank you for your prayers for Daryl Shoemaker. Last Sunday morning, Rita woke up in the middle of the night, and Daryl was not responsive. He was breathing, but he wasn't talking. And so he's been down to Mayo Clinic this week. He's got a little bit of hardware installed in his heart. And he came home last night, and everything's okay. So we are very grateful to God for, for saving him last Sunday, waking Reed up at the right time, and we're thankful for doctors and nurses and the, the, everything God uses. So I should also mention for the Christmas Eve service, um, if you'd like to expand your Christmas repertoire a little bit, uh, we're going to have some songs in English, but we're also going to have a song from the newest nation on our planet, the, the newest country in the world, is South Sudan. And one of the main languages in South Sudan is Noor. And we're going to have some few great singers from South Sudan, well, from our community. But they're going to sing for us in Noor that will be part of our Christmas Eve service. So have some good things that we're heading toward this week. So we begin this morning together, let us call on the name of the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We invite Victor and Karen to come up and read for us with the Advent.
God, the Alpha and the Omega, our beginning and our end. May your spirit kindle in us patience and peace as we wait for the coming of your Son in the humility and boldness to proclaim his reign. We ask this through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
exceed expectation. And may the others see your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
So he thought, well, the perfect follow-up would be to do a doc would be to do a film about the worst baseball player ever. And who's the worst baseball player ever? Charlie Brown. So he lived in San Francisco and he opened up his phone book because he thought that Charles Schultz lived there, the guy who drew Snoopy and Charlie Brown. And he was writing the phone book, so he called them up and they got together and they put together an idea and nobody wanted it. Nobody would make their movie about Charlie Brown. <coughs> Nothing happened. And then in 1965, Time Magazine did the front cover of the magazine about Charlie Brown and Snoopy and Linus and Lucy and, and Coca-Cola contacted Mendelssohn and Schultz and said, have you ever thought of doing a, movie, a Christmas show about Charlie Brown and Peanuts? And they said, uh, what a great idea. They, they hadn't thought of that. And they were guided to do this wonderful Christmas show. And I think for some people it helps them find Christmas. But 90% of Christmas shows all the way back in the 1960s never actually talked about Jesus being more than a manger. And that hasn't really changed, has it? You, you can hear all kinds of things about Christmas that don't actually say anything about Christmas. That, that Christ came into the world to make a way for you and me to be reconciled to God. But it must have been so strange for the actual people involved, you know, that first Christmas, they had no idea what was going on. They, they knew just a little bit, the angels had, an angel had appeared to Elizabeth, and if you think back to Elizabeth, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, Elizabeth, the Bible says, to be gentle was well along in years. And when the angel says to Zechariah, you're going to have a baby with Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Zechariah kind of protests, he says, I am an old man, and he repeats, my wife is well along in years. But Elizabeth receives this, and she says, The Lord has done this for me, and these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the peoples. And she's just so excited, and her pregnancy is going along, and, you know, all her friends are grandmothers, and here she is carrying a baby. And one day, you know, I don't know if they knocked on doors like we do, but... She heard a voice that she hadn't heard in a while. It was a very surprising visitor. Her cousin Mary was at the door. Hi, Elizabeth! And it was like a two or three days walk. It was a long journey that Mary had taken. Mary had just been told that she's going to have a baby. By an angel. So these two cousins, they both are miraculously going to have a baby. And they have this, in, this wonderful encounter. And I wonder what it was like for Mary. Because when Mary gets this news from the angel that she's going to have a baby, her whole life turned upside down. Some of you have lived in smaller towns than Mankato. If you live in a town, if you live in a village like Nazareth, everybody knows everything about you. They know you, they know your parents, they know your grandparents, they know your aunts and uncles, they know your cousins. And what does everybody talk about every day when they go to the cafe or they meet each other? They talk about each other and every. And the story about Mary for the rest of her life in her hometown is going to be that she was pregnant before she got married. Which was incredibly taboo. This was going to be a stigma that would follow her the rest of her life in her home village. You know, that wonderful girl Mary, oh, everybody thought she was, she was terrific. 
like she was, you know, so devout and never made any trouble and, you know, such an honor to her family and, and here she's pregnant. And whose fault is it? It's God's. She knows it's a blessing, but the people around her don't. don't. So I wonder what it was like for her right in the middle of, of this that I think we catch Mary in a very difficult position of joy and fear traveling together. The, the best thing in your life, it can look like the worst thing in your life. The best thing in your life can actually shatter your dreams. The best thing in your life can bring vicious gossip from other people. And in Luke 1 we read, after the angel gave Mary this wonderful announcement that she's going to bear the Son of the Most High. The one whose kingdom will never end. And the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. But then there's your neighbors. And how will they talk about this? So that brings us to verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready. And she hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. As joy and fear can travel together, kind of like with COVID-19 these days, isn't it? We want to get together for Christmas, but we're afraid to get together for Christmas. My, mo my mother is 90 years old, and last spring she made a decision. When all the quarantine decisions were made, uh, she told, I, I have a couple brothers who live in the area too. She lives a little over an hour north. And she said, I'm going to be careful, but I don't want to be a prisoner. She said, if I get sick and die, I know I'm going to be with Jesus. Don't stop visiting me. I want you to stay with me. And so, a few times a month, I get to go up and have supper with her and a couple of my brothers. And she puts her arms out to give me a hug. Dad died a, just about two years ago. And I love being with her, but it's a little bit scary. Because what if I get her sick? That is what she wants. She wants us to come. And, okay, so here's the strange thing. Uh, two of my brothers that go up there with me have both gotten COVID. But when they got sick, they quarantined. So we, we've missed some, some weeks together where we haven't gotten together. We're, we're trying to be careful. But... In your life and in my life, you know, we, we know God is working and we're excited about what God's doing, but there's parts that we don't really have full control over. There's parts where we're, we're not in charge and we have to trust God to work in our lives and to provide and to protect. When Charles Schultz was in first grade, his mother helped him get valentines for everybody in his class so that nobody would be offended by not getting one. But he was so shy that he couldn't put them in the box at the front of the classroom. He was just afraid to walk up to the front of the classroom and put in his valentines. So he took them all home again to his mother. And that's how he was his whole life. He, he was always shy and seemed a little bit insecure to people. When he was a teenager, he was, he was the youngest student in his class at Minneapolis Central High School. And he liked to draw, so he submitted some drawings to the high school yearbook, and they were rejected. We're, we don't understand everything that God's doing in our lives, and we have people who are going to give us negative feedback. He was in World War II, and after serving there, he came back to Minneapolis, and he got a job in, at a place called the Bureau of Engraving. It had an art instruction school, so he was working in this, this art correspondence school. 
And he started drawing, and he, he started drawing cartoons about a little boy and his dog. And he got a newspaper to agree to publish them. And there were a few other papers that were publishing them. And they insisted on calling it Peanuts, and he hated the name Peanuts. But that was all they would do. So he, he would, every week, he would go down to the, the mail room in his business there, the, the Bureau of Engraving, and he, he'd wrap up his, cart, his cartoon for the week, and he'd send it in. And one day, he was talking with a, the, the post office guy, and he asked about it. And so Charles Schultz told him. And so the next week, he came back, and the post office guy said, Oh, I read your comic strip last night. I didn't think much of it. You will have critics. And the Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. That there, there is this voice that comes in telling you, you're no good. God could never love you. You do not deserve to be called a Christian. And joy and fear travel together. And Jesus is the one whose voice matters, not the enemies. And we look at Elizabeth and Mary, and what do we see that happened there? It says, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And Mary and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth knew that she was experiencing a miracle. That she should not be pregnant. That an angel had appeared to her husband in the temple, and now her husband couldn't talk for nine months. And then her cousin walks in, and we're not sure how far Mary was along. She may not have been very far along, but somehow Elizabeth perceives what's going on. She is filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will awaken you. You know, woke up Elizabeth to what was happening. Charles Schultz came back from World War II, and he, God opened his heart to Christ. He became a Christian. And the experience sparked a love inside him for the Bible, for God's Word. He became a voracious reader of the Bible and started reading theological commentaries. And in his personal Bible, the, the, the margins were just filled with notes that he wrote, trying to, to understand everything that he was reading there. He was a longtime Sunday school teacher. He took one group through an entire study of the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit will stir us up and pull us along. The Holy Spirit will tell us who we are and who we're not. He, he knew he was a comic strip writer, but Schultz said, I don't think I'm a true artist. He said, I would love to be Picasso or Andrew Wyatt. But I can draw pretty well, and I can write pretty well, and I think I'm doing the best I can with whatever abilities I've been giving, given. And what more can we ask? And God has put abilities in you. And it, it, we're not necessarily who we want to be. Oh, I wanted to be a professional football player. That somehow, I don't think I missed that calling, do you? <laughs> but God has put some abilities in each one of us, whether it's baking Christmas cookies for somebody who's lonely, whether it's being able to listen to people when they're going through a difficulty, whether it's showing hospitality, especially when there's not a global pandemic going on. And God will use us. The Holy Spirit will awaken you. God's Word will guide you. We read here in Luke 1 that Elizabeth, in a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. So why did God have Elizabeth say, 
this, and it doesn't say these words in here, but I think Mary needed this. I think Mary needed to hear this. I didn't dream it. I'm not crazy. Joseph won't divorce me, I think. I hope. It doesn't matter what the neighbors say back home. God had come into her and had put a baby inside her womb. And this baby would change the world. But it put a teenage girl in a difficult spot. Mary needed this. I, Elizabeth needed this. Elizabeth is bearing this miraculous child, this one who will proclaim the way of the Lord, the Messiah, after she should not have been able to bear a child. But Elizabeth needs a Savior. And Elizabeth says that this, you are the mother of my Lord. Isn't that an extraordinary declaration? Not that this is just an incredible that, you know, you're, that this is a miraculous birth, but she says, your baby is my Lord, my Lord and Savior, the Messiah, the Son of God. She says, why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? God's word will guide you. Now, for Elizabeth, it was God speaking his word directly through her. Um, I'm not sure that that happens with us like quite like that. But we can come directly to God's word. We have God's word in the Bible. And we can open it up. I mean, if you look in the church newsletter or look on the, our Facebook page, and there's a chapter listed every day, and you know, this week it'll be cha chapters about Jesus, our Savior, and the Christmas story. God's word will guide you. Charles Schultz talked about it this way. He said, you can grind out daily gags, but I'm not interested in simply doing gags. I'm interested in doing a script that says something and makes some comment on the important things in life. Then he said, I preach in these cartoons, and I reserve the same rights to say what I want to say as the minister in the pulpit. When Charlie Brown catches Snoopy stealing food out of the refrigerator, Charlie Brown pulls out a Bible and opens to the book of Numbers, or Exodus, Exodus, and he says to Snoopy, Look, it says here in Exodus, Thou shalt not steal. And then Snoopy reaches out and takes the book from Charlie, the Bible, and he flips over to Numbers, and he reads, we don't actually hear him, but he points it out to Charlie Brown, and Charlie Brown reads, Deuteronomy 25.4, You shall not muzzle the ox while he treads out the grain. <laughs> Snoopy is saying, I'm not stealing. I'm your dog. I've earned it. And on what basis? On the Bible. In a comic strip. When Schultz had Linus asked, well, Schultz had Linus asked, do you ever pray, Lucy? Charlie Brown once confessed to Lucy, sometimes I wonder if God is pleased with me. Peanuts has more than 40 strips about prayer. It has five or 600 strips about the Bible and about God and prayer. So a man from Coca-Cola called Lee Mendelson after that Time magazine cover and he said, we're, we're looking for a Christmas show. Do you have any ideas for us? And they didn't, but Lee said, oh, I think we might. And Lee Mendelson, the producer, and he got together with Charles Schultz and they wrote this Christmas story. But Schultz was stubborn about it. Charles Schultz said, Bill, another one of his collaborators, we can't get around it. If we're going to do a Christmas story, we have to use the famous passage about baby Jesus. Charles Schultz and Charlie Brown stands there and says, What is Christmas about? Does anybody know what Christmas is about? And Linus walks out and says, I can tell you, Charlie. Charlie Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is about. 
and he recites Luke chapter 2 about the birth of Christ. Schultz was adamant about this. His friend Lee Melendez tried to talk him out of it, and Schultz said, if we don't do it, who will? A Charlie Brown Christmas was screened by CBS executives just a, a week before it was supposed to air, and they, the producer said, Schultz's friend Melendez said, said, they didn't get the voices, they did not understand the music, they didn't get the pacing. They said, this is probably going to be the last Peanuts special ever. But we've got a schedule for next week, so we've got to air it. And half the people in the country were watching Linus read Luke chapter 2 that night. God was working. God's word will guide you. We need that, this Savior, Jesus Christ. But there's another little thing I want to point you to in this passage this morning. I want to encourage you to be God's voice of encouragement. We read, Blessed, Elizabeth says to Mary, Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Blessed are you among women, the angel said, and blessed is the child you will, no, I'm sorry, she says, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Jesus, later on in his ministry, he says, he took children in his arms, and he put his hands on them, and he blessed them. When a man came to Jesus with leprosy, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man and said, be clean. People need to hear a word of encouragement, and God can use you to give that word of encouragement. That, that's one other thing I want to think about with Elizabeth this morning. Because to my astonishment several years ago, I found out where Charles Schultz got some important encouragement. I used to work in a publishing house California for a man named Bill Gregg, but he was from Minneapolis, and his father was Bill Gregg Sr., and his father worked at the Bureau of Engraving in the Art Instruction School, and he was at his barber one day, and sitting in the barber shop was the barber's son, Charlie, and Charlie was sitting there drawing. He loved to draw. That's all he did. He just drew. And Mr. Greg saw him drawing, and Mr. Greg, unfortunately, a lot of barbers were not making much money at that point in time, a few decades back. And Mr. Greg offered little Charlie a free correspondence course from the Art Instruction School. Isn't that wonderful? He saw that talent, he saw that ability, and then Charlie went off to World War II and he came back and Mr. Greg offered him a job at the Art Instruction School. And Mr. Greg Jr., the gentleman I knew, he said, I loved reading Peanuts because I knew all the characters. He said, Charles Schultz wrote in people that we worked with. At, at this place. He said, I knew who Peppermint Patty was, I knew who Lucy was, I knew who Linus was, I knew who Schroeder was. God used Charles Schultz, but it took somebody else to speak into his life when he was a boy and, and you know, give him a little extra boost. And I wonder, who does God want to use you to give a boost to? Who does God want to use you, like Elizabeth, to Encourage somebody that blessed is the one who believes that the word, that God's promise will be fulfilled in her life or his life. Charles Schultz said, little things we say and do in Christ's name are like pebbles thrown into water. The ripples spread out in circles and influence people we may know only slightly and sometimes not at all. God is going to use you. And we are going to celebrate communion. And if, if you have been baptized,
baptized and if you are trusting in Jesus, if you're opening your heart to Christ this morning, honestly saying, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin and I ask you to change me. We invite you to, to participate with us in communion. And it says in a couple of verses that I read, you know, how Elizabeth blessed Mary and Jesus reached out and he touched the leper and blessed him and Jesus touched the children and blessed them. And that's one thing I love about coming to communion, that Jesus is here to touch you and bless your life. Whatever you're facing this morning, I invite you to bring, bring that to Christ. We will bring the, the bread and the cup to you. And in the tray, I should tell you, the purple cups around the outside are wine. The clear cups in the middle are grape juice. So go ahead and choo choose what's the best thing for you there. So we get to seek Christ in this way. And at this point,
and sisters in Christ on every continent. And Lord, we ask that you would provide for their needs. Lord, you have put us in a privileged place. And we pray for brothers and sisters who are persecuted, for those who do not wake up in the morning knowing where their, their meals are coming from that day. Lord, be their good shepherd, be their provider for all their needs. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And God, as we approach Christmas, we thank you that you sent your only son into the world to die for us. And Lord, you did that to wipe out our sin. And you conquered sin and death in all the works of Satan. And Lord, we pray for healing for those that are on our hearts this morning. We thank you for the way you've worked in Daryl Shoemaker's life this week. Lord, give him full, rapid recovery. And Lord Jesus, we pray for those who are under treatments for cancer or facing surgery or who have diagnoses that the doctors don't fully understand. Lord, be their great physician. We look to you for healing. Lord, in your mercy.
our Lord Jesus Christ, in his precious blood, strengthen and preserve you in true faith to everlasting life. You stand with me, please, as we pray together. Let your servants depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. May the Lord bless all your skills and be pleased with the work of your hands. May he ride across the heavens to help you. May you abound with the Lord's favor and be full of his blessing. Amen. You may be seated. Let's sing one more great Christmas song.